Hi, everyone. Thank you for taking part in today's panel discussion about supporting service coordinators. I'm Melissa Harris, the Director of Government Affairs for the American Association of Service Coordinators, and I'm going to be moderating today's discussion that's going to be based on ASK's latest service coordinator salary survey. For the first time in four years, ASK surveyed service coordinators to better understand the economic conditions they're facing and determine average salaries nationwide and by state. We paused on the survey for a few years, you may have noticed, because we knew that if we went back to doing it, we wanted it to be more than just a spreadsheet of results. We really wanted it to be useful for service coordinators, employers, and policymakers alike, and be the start of a really big conversation about how to change the industry for the better and to move it forward. So that's why this time you might have noticed that the salary survey had way more information and different information than it used to in the past. For the first time, we sought demographic information that would hopefully provide context to the salary survey findings. And as a result, these results are more important than they've ever been, more expansive than they've ever been. And it is really important right now because companies are looking to provide comparable wages and benefits right now because there's really extremely high turnover in all industries, but especially the service coordinator industry. And that's largely as a result of low wages and burnout based on other surveys that we've done. So these results are really important to help us address those things. The results of the salary survey, when we look at them on their face, are both encouraging and discouraging, unfortunately. While the reported average hourly wage has increased to an average of $24 per hour, it's only increased so much as inflation. So that probably means that even though service coordinators saw financial increases, their financial situations actually haven't probably improved much as a result of that. Meanwhile, nearly all service coordinators report receiving benefits, which is great, but we also saw lots of comments that service coordinators are unable to afford health insurance because it would just take too much of their paycheck um, for the cost of it. Another striking finding that we found was that half of service coordinators are taking on second jobs and freelance gigs to help make ends meet. That was really shocking. And then another especially concerning thing that we found is that 39% of service coordinators are the sole earners in their families. Half of those report having to take care of their dependents as well, whether it's children or other family members. So on their salary, they're taking care of entire families, about 20% of service coordinators. Of the more than 1,500 respondents to this year's survey, more than a third submitted comments in addition to completing the salary questions. And you're going to notice in the report and in today's discussion, I'm going to mention a lot of those comments that the respondents left. The most common sentiment was, I love my job. Far and away, that was the number one comment that we heard, I love my job. But many times there was a but following that. It was, I love my job, but I'm tired, but I'm underpaid for what I do, for who I serve, for my experience and my degree, for the number of years I've been working in the field. And worse yet, I saw a lot of, I love what I do, but I'm looking for other jobs that pay more, jobs that provide more flexibility, jobs where I don't feel so isolated as the only service coordinator in my community or in my company. And so to address that, today we've gathered resident services and organization leaders in the industry who make it their mission to support service coordinators and build an employee culture that values the work of service coordinators. You know, even when that can't always be in the form of the wages that service coordinators deserve, there's lots of ways to support service coordinators that we're going to talk about today. We're going to be expanding on some of the salary survey report findings, and the panelists are going to provide experiences and best practices for addressing service coordinator needs and improving working conditions. I'm honored to be joined today by our panelists, Linda Coleman, Natasha Fosu, and Ron Medinas. Linda is Vice President of Resident Services at Human Good. She's responsible for the overall planning, coordination, and service delivery for all of Human Good's affordable housing communities and ensures that residents are receiving the assistance they need to maintain and improve their quality of life. Human Good has more than 70 resident services team members, which include four life enrichment coordinators and two registered nurses. Service coordinators work in nearly all of Human Good's 101 owned and managed communities in nine states, including Washington, California, Oregon, Arizona, Nevada, Idaho, Delaware, Pennsylvania, and Massachusetts. 
Natasha is the Senior Director of Resident Services at Volunteers of America National Services. She provides national oversight for Volunteers of America's multi-million dollar service coordinator program that's sponsored by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. VOA has 146 service coordinators in 173 properties across the country. And Ron is the Vice President and Chief Operating Officer for Wesley Housing Corporation. Wesley has 32 elderly housing facilities, housing more than 2,200 elderly families in conventional HUD and housing authority units in Tennessee, Kentucky, and Arkansas. 30 of these facilities have service coordinators. And in addition to oversight, marketing, and compliance responsibilities for these facilities, Ron develops and administers grants from various federal and local organizations. Once again, I'm really honored to have all of these experts in the industry join us today to discuss this important topic. And so we are just going to dive right in because we only have an hour. So for my first question, we really want these salary survey results to ultimately result in increased pay. That's the main goal here. Whether that means companies mm -hmm. see their service coordinators aren't making the average in their state or in the nation based on their experience or education. Um, that's one way that we can see increased pay from the salary survey. Another is that we can all collectively advocate with policymakers um, or funders for increased wages for service coordinators. So let's start off with the first question um, or today's discussion is how do you go to bat for your service coordinators? How do you fight for them and make sure that the salaries offered at your companies are competitive enough to attract and retain quality service coordinators? And so I'm going to throw this to Linda first, because I know you've used previous salary surveys to make the case for property management and HUD that wages need to be higher. Um, and so I'll have you start and then let others chime in with the strategies that you use to push for increased wages at your organization. Thank you, Melissa. And I uh, really just want to offer my um, appreciation to you for facilitating this conversation, this important conversation uh, for resident services. Um, so to answer your question, it, Absolutely, with the 2019 survey results, I started utilizing that information as benchmarking. So realizing that um, we had a our second affiliation with, uh, within Human Good, and so we took on an additional maybe 15 service coordinators and realized that their pay was a lot less than what they should be making. So started really digging into it, started doing the research with the benchmarking, um, and then started asking our friendly competitors what their wages are uh, for their resident services team member. And believe it or not, they were very open and willing to offer that information. So from there, started really just kind of doing a comparable of the results from the ASK survey. We can look at Indeed, um, asking again our friendly compet competitors, and then offering that information to HR and our senior leadership to look at the discrepancies. So that's kind of where we where I started and that started about four or five years ago and I've been doing it since. And I feel that the conversation about compensation is like a regular conversation. I think it for me, it's almost like a weekly conversation. Um, we had our annual conference last week for affordable housing and um, you know, compensation of course came up as our team members were presenting and offering their feedback to our COO. And he said, you know, we may not be the highest paid, but we want to stay competitive. Um, so I think being transparent also with our team members is critical that we're not going to be able to pay the, the highest salary, but we want to stay competitive. I'll stop there and then offer Natasha and, and Rob. Well, I mean, I would also say to uh, working with the development to make sure like just to get in where they're starting the process because we need to at least start with setting realistic salaries and that hasn't always been the case in the past um, so now we're at the table with development saying you know is this work will this not work because they're making decisions and they don't fully understand what it takes to support the service coordinator position to me when you're hiring a super a service coordinator it's more than just that salary line item you have training, you have travel, you have ask membership, you have ask online. There are so many things that it takes to support that service coordination position. And, some, and sometimes they're just not aware. So now that we have a seat at the table and we're telling them these are the things we need, this is a salary that's more realistic. We're finding it now, it's, it's easier. We're part of the process, development's listening. Um, but I also say, even with asset management and property management, we have to be a part of the budgeting process. We were not a part of that budgeting process. Um, so now we're aware when they go 
rent increases. I'm putting together the budget. I'm working with affiliates to create their service coordinator budget, which is which is so important. Um, so we can get annual increases. So we can get performance um, based increases too by doing the, um, the rent increase. So having that team approach, I think is important for us. Our structure is resident service, compliance, property management, and asset management, we all report to the same person now. So we're at the table together talking about these different things because you think people understand what we do in services and even in your departments, they still don't understand. So that communication is so important and being having a seat at the table and part of that process is so important. And so um, just to build a little bit off of um, what Linda and, and Natalie and uh, Natasha have talked about, um, there, there, there are limits to what we can do. <laughs> um, our properties only get so much money. Uh, even if you have a grant, you only get so much money. And what our job is, is to try and maximize those resources, those uh, revenue incomes to be able to afford the best that we can do for our, for our employees. And that's, that's all of our employees. So. When I'm looking at a property and I have to understand that not only do my FTE, my full-time employee wages come out of the budget, but I also have to have money to take care of residents and buildings and all the other things that we have to take care of. Um, so that can be that can be challenging. And, and sometimes, especially um, people in my position have a tendency to uh, take care of buildings um, a little bit more than they do uh, services to residents because if I fail an Inspire inspection, then I'm in a lot of trouble. And so I tend to um, prioritize those things over the services to the residents. Now, our company does not do that. We, we really revolve around the services that we provide. And what I've tried to do is to try and move a lot of our service coordinator grants to rents uh, because I've found that I can, pro I can get more money from the rents. The, Grants are only increased by so much each year, and you can ask for additional money, but you don't always get it. Whereas rents, I can take all the services that we provide, the transportation, the fact that we provide nurses, we have an exercise physiologist that works with our residents. Uh, we have uh, health clinics on our properties. We can take all those non-sheltered services and add them into our rent comparability study and come up with a higher rent so that we're able to have more resources to pay our, our, uh, our employees. And um, what, what I also try to do is I try to use as many different sources as I can to come up with kind of what Linda was talking about, a benchmark um, that is what a social worker or a nurse um, would make in our area. And then I come up with a general basis for that. And then we have an algorithm that adds money on if you have a master's degree, for instance, or you have other qualifications. Uh, size of property is important. So our algorithm takes all of those into account so that not only are we paying our folks as much as we can, but it's fair across. We don't have somebody, you know, who takes care of 200 residents making more money that takes than somebody who takes care of 80. So we try to do as much as we can with fairness and uh, realizing that none of my folks make as much money as they deserve. Um, we just try to spread the resources as best we can. You know, Melissa, if I, could, if I could mention one last thing too, is um, why not offer resident service coordinators a sign-on bonus? So I started seeing this in other departments within our organization, and I said, why not resident service coordinators, especially, you know, some of our communities are, are incredibly challenging. Um, so we started offering a sign-on bonus. Um, and so, you know, talking about pay transparency, talking about, you know, equity, equitable pay as well you know those just we just need to constantly have those conversations amongst our various departments including hr and senior leadership so i, I we've been fortunate offering a sign-on bonus and that's gone over really well and um and one of the things linda was talking about with benchmarking too we have to realize that we're just not competing with other hud properties for our our employees um, we're also competing with Social Security and we're competing with the state and we're competing with MCOs and we're competing with a lot of other organizations that hire social workers and nurses so that we have to be competitive with them as well. Um, now we offer some benefits that they don't offer. You know, my folks generally work eight to five, five days a week. 
holidays off. A lot of those other jobs don't provide that. So there are some benefits to being a, um, uh, a, uh, a service coordinator uh, on a property rather than working some of those jobs and some of those pay higher. You have to offset that with what your your personal needs are, though. If if you have children or a family at home, it might not pay as much, but it might be a better job for you to work as a service coordinator than it is making more money at Social Security, but we're having to work weekends and nights. I want to say that I'm glad that we now have, well, we have access now to the that survey that gives me, because I'm doing my own research and I'm trying to figure things out. So I'm like, now I have this document to go to the table with when I'm talking to development, when I'm talking to, you know, property management, like here's this information right here. I am not going to be able to hire somebody making less than this. And this is what the state is offering right now. So it makes it, you know, it, it gives it some credence to say, hey, like we can't, offer less than this for this position. So going forward, this is going to be a great tool for me to help and have discussions when setting a salary for these positions. So I'm very grateful for this. Good. Yes, I hope that's true for all organizations. Um, I think I heard all of you say, though, that you don't pay your service coordinators what you wish that you could. And a lot of that is because it's ultimately up to HUD or someone else who's setting these budgets and it's kind of out of your control. Um, but Ron, you mentioned one way that you do this is convert grants to budget-based positions. That gives you a little bit more flexibility, opens up additional funding options for the properties. So I'm curious to learn from all of you guys more about those options out there and hear what types of tips you can share for getting creative and finding funding for your service coordinator programs. And Ron, I would love for you to start if you can expand it all on moving to a budget-based position from a grant and then any other tips you have. Yeah, sure. So um, the way rents work now is that HUD, you have to provide a rent comparability study to HUD and then they base your rents off of the rent comparability study that you provide. Um, if you have, if I have a grant that pays uh, say $100,000 a year, and I have a 300 unit apartment complex, and I can get $100 a unit for service coordination, then obviously I can get a lot more money off of putting it into the rents than I can off of the grant. So moving those services as part of my rent comparability study increases what I can get in comparable rents. For instance, if they compare my property, and that's all they're doing is they're comparing properties in a rent comparability study. So if they compare my property to another property and I have a nurse, for instance, and they don't, then I get bonus money onto my rents compared to the other uh, comparable uh, property that they use. And so adding it's a if you are service oriented as an organization and you provide you add all of those services in like every one of my properties has transportation. You know, we're, we're starting to go to um, free laundry. Um, we're putting Wi-Fi on every property. Um, so if, if you start adding those services in, then when you do your rent comparability study, you get more money into your rents than what you spend providing the services. So that allows you an opportunity to be able to increase salaries and do different things with, uh, with your employees. Um, understand too, over about the last six or seven years, our properties have experienced about a 25 or a 26 or a 27 or a 28 percent increase in what our insurance payments are property insurance liability insurance all of those insurances that's a tremendous amount of money when say for instance we're paying two million dollars a year on property insurance and we get a 25 percent increase i mean that's that's big bucks and that pressure is on the properties as well and believe it or not affordable properties cost more to insure than other properties do. And in some markets, some owners can't get insurance at all. So um, there's a lot of pressures right now on our budgets on the properties, and that kind of takes away from what we can do with our employees as well, because obviously we can't, can't go without insurance. Well, we also have uh, converted grants to budget base, but most of our grants didn't even cover the service coordinator position. So we would have grants, and then we also have some that were partially um, budget-based as well. But maybe not so much in so creative, but we found ways to say, hey, like, what can we do to increase the salary? If we need to do QA for free and maybe take that 
QA budget line item and add it to the salary, we can do that. Or for some grants, you get indirects. I don't know if people are familiar with the indirect. You get 10% of the full amount of the grant to do grant management. So we would put that back into the salary. So these were just little ways to try to add to the salary line item if you have those, you know, that option and if your um, organization allows for it. But it's just kind of a way to move money around. And if you can do it, that's just some place you can add it that we were actually able to hire and promote and um, because of that increase in moving that money around. So that helped out get our, our team leads actually using using that approach to try to finagle the money. So that helped. Um, one of my prime goals uh, for resident services is to continue to find funding sources. Um, and I think it's in healthcare. And we're all hearing how housing is healthcare and healthcare, the MCOs have deep pockets. So we've been able to uh, partner with health plans at set aside a certain number of apartments for the health plan. And they could be folks that have been in nursing homes or institutionalized or whatever the case may be. So we've set aside more or less about 10% of our apartments. And that has created a huge revenue stream for us. Uh, we've had partnerships for the last seven, eight years, and we continue to partner with other health plans, primarily in California. We're trying to extend this in Pennsylvania and Washington as well. Um, and uh, just building that relationship and networking with health plans that uh, where we have our uh, missions are very much aligned about, about serving, uh, serving people and taking care of people. Um, and it's been a great benefit. So we've been able to utilize some of those healthcare funds to offset the salaries of our resident service coordinators. It does come with some added responsibilities um, uh, when you pair up with the health plan, but that's where we can increase the wages of the service coordinators from some of that funding from the health plans. So that's been of great benefit. Um, also to Natasha's point is making sure we're collecting quality assurance fees. That's a no brainer, right? That's HUD guidelines. We are allowed to collect a up to 10% of the resident service coordinator salary for QA. Um, also 202 PRAC properties, we should be able to collect that funding. Now that is for the provision of direct services for residents. So that's not gonna be able to be utilized for the compensation of the service coordinators. But I gotta tell you, when we tell our service coordinators, you work at a 202 PRAC community, we're gonna be able to, or we just got approved an additional 10 or $20,000 for programming, they get super excited because this will hopefully um, empower them to develop new programs for the community. So um, that's been a real benefit. So hopefully everybody that's on that works at a 202 PRAC or has a 202 PRAC is really taking advantage uh, of that funding source. Yeah, we just did that perfect red PRAC conversion. Yeah. So process of that now and then just seeing all that money now that they have the programs and services. I mean, again, it's not for the service coordinator, but it gives you the opportunity to bring in programs and do things mm -hmm. we were able to do previously. Yeah. So it, a little excitement in that position to be able to provide the program, mm -hmm. have the money to do things when we typically mm -hmm. don't need to do anything. It's you know those connections. So that. Mm -hmm. that's let me um, let me say this. You know when you go to different areas of the country, um, HUD is not consistent. <laughs> Some places will allow you to do things that other places will not allow you to do. For instance, for about fifteen years we have gotten service coordinators added into our 202 PRACs, uh, their salary, their programming, everything, HUD has allowed us to do that. So we have been able to, in our budgets, write in uh, the full program for service coordinators, as well as the extra $15 per unit per month for the provision of direct services. So different places, different HUD uh, requirements, and they'll let you do different things. Uh, one of the other things that we've done too is that um, when you have a property that can, that you um, you take get a tax credit award for LIHTC low income housing tax credits, uh, once once it goes from a nonprofit, which most of our 202s were nonprofits originally, once they go from a nonprofit to a for profit under the low income housing tax credit program, then it's a for profit owner. You have to be a for profit owner in order to take tax credits because nonprofits don't pay taxes. 
So once you do that as a for-profit entity, then each year the owner is allowed to take distributions out of the property and those distributions go to the owner. And we have friendly owners who have um, actually funded service coordinators on properties that we manage that don't have funding for service coordinators at all. For instance, we have two properties that are um, uh, public housing properties that there's no funding for service coordinators on. And our owners of our low income housing tax credit properties have taken a part of their distributions and set it aside for service coordination on those properties. Uh, I have heard some other people talk about um, they've gotten um, their cities, they've gotten their fire departments to kind of kick in some money. Um, they've found some local grants that have kicked in some money. So there are some external sources out there that you can kind of tap into if you can find them, unfortunately, in Tennessee. They like to hang on to their pocketbooks, so we don't have very many of those. <laughs> but um, but in your area, it's it's kind of uh, geographically specific, where you know different places allow for different things. Yeah, those are all great suggestions, um, and I love that you guys shared the PAC funding, which is supportive services funds. I do encourage everyone to take advantage of those as well. Ask has some resources on our website to help anybody who wants to try to get those funds for supportive services for their property. Because um, that really is something that it's not, like you said, it's something that directly is for the service coordinator, but it makes their job more fulfilling when they can plan programs and do what they want to do with their residents. And it maybe feels less stressful and more interesting, right? And so that kind of leads into my next question of, you know, a lot of the things that you guys just talked about are things that are going to take some time, right? Um, they're not things that can happen overnight. They're things that maybe you need to work with HUD or developers, um, it, partners. It could be something that maybe you could plan for a year or two from now. So I would love to hear from you guys what can be done to support service coordinators in the meantime while we're waiting for some of these longer term things to happen, uh, whether it's all the way to the top of like Congress providing more funding for service coordinators to getting supportive services funds on your property from HUD, switching from a grant to a budget. Um, you know, what can be done right now to support your service coordinators as an organization? And so, Natasha, I want to throw it to you first, because I just have to say that VOA was called out a number of times in the comments of the salary survey in a good way, um, which was a good thing because not all of the comments were positive. But uh, VOA, multiple times I heard from commenters that they feel like they have the support of their organization. Maybe they don't make as much as they wish they did, but they do love their jobs and they love where they work. And so I want to hear from all of you, but if Natasha, you could start, you know, what are some of those strategies that you use to support your team um, that makes them feel fulfilled in their role as a service coordinator, even when maybe they're not able to make the amount that they deserve? Well, well specifically speaking to the team that um, I supervise, I mean, communication is just so critical. Um, and I think having that reporting structure where the service coordinator reports to a services person versus a property manager, uh, they just feel more supported in that role because they're dealing with someone who knows what they're doing, who understands that. Um, and so I'm always looking for ways to strengthen the team and kind of listening to what, what they're saying. And we were also able to, like I said before, create these team lead positions for our service coordinators, which gave them advancement opportunities for the first time and more flexibility. So we weren't able to see like anybody go up in service coordination. It was just like you were just a service coordinator. So now having that opportunity for leads. Um, but then I think also you need that feedback. I do an anonymous survey and I do an anonymous because I want everyone to be honest with me. I'm asking things like, you know, what can I do to better support you? Are there any unmet needs? How can I improve my leadership? Like, what's working? What's not working? Um, and then when you get those responses, make sure you address it. So I have a meeting to go over what the, the results were and like, here are the things that we need to do. I want to make sure that I'm addressing their needs and their concerns and whatever's in my power, they know that I'm going to fight for it. Um, and just follow through is, is huge. Do what you say you're going to do um, and don't promise things that you can't do. Just just really be honest. And I mean, my team, they know I'm there for them weekends, late nights, even on vacation. 
um, if something's going on and they need me, I'm, I'm there. And I just think it's the small things. Like, again, like we wish we can pay them so much more, but it's just really like the small things, you know, just even if somebody's birthday's on a Saturday, like I'll reach out on a Saturday and text them and just, you know, they know that you care and you're thinking of them. I just think it's just so important. I can go next. Um, I would add to make certain that senior leadership understands the role of resident services and the value that we bring to our communities. I think that's critical. When we have our resident services retreat, I like to invite our CEO. And um, so he gets a bigger, kind of the big picture of what resident service coordinators, uh, what they do in our, in our communities. And uh, he's come annually to our retreats and he says, the resident service coordinators are my favorite team members within the organization. And I mean, you know, he doesn't have to say that, but I mean, he really means it. I mean, we really are um, his favorite people. So I think that's really meaningful for the service coordinators. Um, secondly, I would say uh, what's been really important is helping grow resident service coordinators and really working with them on an individual career development plan. Uh, we know the majority are may stay, and I think on average the survey said uh, three years, two, three years, I believe is what the survey results said from ASK. And um, we wanna help them on that track. We wanna help develop them. And whether that's attending a leadership development program, maybe through leading age or wherever the case may be, we also have a partnership with the University of Arizona where it's a full tuition grant, meaning you don't have to pay a dime for your undergrad or for your master's. Um, so just working on an individualized plan for the service coordinator and helping them uh, develop their career for the future, I think um, speaks volumes to how we really wanna support um, all, of our, all of our team members. You know, I forgot to add, which is, so important also that when we look at our organization as a whole, when we make big changes or we roll out a new initiative, we always reach out to service coordinators. We have um, people that we reach out to just to make sure that they're at the table. Because I think when you're making decisions that affect them, um, they need to be a part of that decision-making process and part of the team. So we don't roll out anything big without having a little meeting, running it by um, you know our more seasoned service coordinators who've been here for a while and say, hey, this is what we're thinking. Does this make sense? Um, even with our assessments, you know, sometimes we can overassess, and they're just like, wait, that's going to take six hours to do that assessment. This doesn't make sense. So we like to get their input before we make anything final because that's so important. And this, so as far as training too, what do you need? What do you need training on? What do you need to help do your job? It's just not us dictating, but also getting their feedback and their buy-in and having them at the table as well, because they have, they're the ones who have to implement it. So that's crucial as well, I think. Natasha, what I'm hearing from you is what does diversity, equity, and inclusion look like in your organization, right? Including your resident service coordinators and making sure that they're heard and listening to their feedback. So spot on. I agree. Excuse me. We're, we're a little more fortunate than my other two colleagues that are on this because we're regionally, um, we're regionally uh, um, situated. And so we um, we quarterly have get together in person service coordinator meetings. Um, the quarter that we don't do it is usually when we have the um, ask conference. Um, we do that with our managers and then our maintenance men have semi annual meetings because the managers don't want to let the maintenance men go for more than a day. Um, but we try to get together for collaboration. I think that's really important. Um, to have teamwork, uh, a teamwork aspect and a teamwork um, mentality in your company. <clears throat> and so we try to get together at least quarterly. And then we have uh, one annual fling where everybody in the company comes together. And that's usually in October. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. And so um, we get to have those collaborations and that teamwork. <clears throat> for our employees because we're kind of locally <coughs> wow something's got me um we're kind of locally uh, situated and our, we're geographically located close enough where we can bring those folks together um i know that other companies are either nationally or 
widely regional um, in their ge geographic location and they can't necessarily do that. Um, we have started, and one of, the, one of the truisms that we have to accept in housing <clears throat> is that there's not a great deal of opportunity to be promoted. Um, it's true with our service coordinators, true with our maintenance men, it's true with our managers to a lesser extent. Our managers are at least can be regional managers or directors at some point, but uh, for our service coordinators, they're service coordinators. And so um, the, the opportunity to advance is, is limited. Um, we have started with our managers to do what we call senior managers. And they go to different properties and they help either new or struggling managers or they just assist the regional managers in doing paperwork and stuff like that. And we're looking to expand that to our service coordinators and to our maintenance men so that we have senior folks um, that can go around and kind of do that type of work too. So it's not a it's not a great promotion. I mean, I can't make them a vice president or anything, but it is some type of advance advancement that they can feel like they're doing more than than they were doing when they were first hired 10 or 15 years ago. Um, that's that's just the reality of the industry, though. There's just not a lot of advancement opportunities unless you go to another company who has an opening in a, in a more advanced position. <clears throat> I, I have to say, Ron, that's something that we continue to explore within resident services because <laughs> looking at our structure, um, you know, we have the resident services supervisors, we have a lead, we have a quality assurance program manager. So I think it's it's um, it's important and critical that we find different pathways for our team members. And it may not always be in resident services. It may be in operations. It may be in compliance. It may be in human resources. Uh, but I think for us is really as we develop these career development plans with our team members, um, is helping them design their dreams. You know, I mean, it's great that they're, we don't want them to leave resident services. I don't want them to leave. But um, if they really want growth and we really want to, um, you know, support our, our people, you know, there's been a lot of times that we've, uh, I've had to work with certain team members to transition into a different department. And that's absolutely okay because I just hope that they will stay committed to the organization. Yeah, I love all of those strategies for improving job satisfaction when, you know, we're waiting for the opportunity to increase salaries or working on that other piece. Um, another way that companies can be really competitive in the employment market is through benefits packages, right? And um, but that can be kind of tough. So we know that health insurance rates continue to go annually. That hurts not only the property budget, because that's cutting into the service coordinator budget to have to pay for those high insurance costs out of the salary and fringe line item. Um, but it's also hurting the service coordinators take home pay. Um, we saw that in the salary survey. A lot of people said in the comments that, again, they don't take their benefits that are offered to them because it just eats up their entire paycheck. Um, and so, again, that may be a long term thing that or a larger issue that we have to deal with with insurance costs going up. That's kind of outside of what you might be able to do at your company's or address. Um, but there are lots of other benefits that you can give that maybe don't come as a great of a cost to the organization. Um, and that could be something that you could offer to service coordinators like Linda, you mentioned the Arizona State Partnership, which sounds amazing. Um, so do any of you guys have um, those types of benefits that are kind of outside of the typical health insurance, dental insurance that you provide as an organization that you can um, give examples of for others on the call. And so this is really a two-part question because first I want to hear that, but I also want to hear from you guys, what is the percentage that you guys are typically spending for the salary and fringe line item toward benefits for your service coordinators? So I think that's important to point out too. I know a lot of times I hear this in the salary survey, I saw this, that people are saying my salary line item is way higher than the amount that I'm being given, actually. Uh, that's way more than my paycheck. And so um, that's likely because a good portion of it is also for your benefits um, as service coordinators. So if you guys, again, two-part question can tell me 
what percentage typically you're paying on average out of that salary and fringe for the service printer benefits, but then also what are some of those other non-traditional benefits that you're able to provide your service coordinators to better support them? Um, I guess I, I can start. Um, <clears throat> we um, we offer, um, we, we've tried to expand our benefits package, especially over the last four or five years, um, because it's, um, I, I hope that our employees look at a benefit package when they're looking for at their, um, at what they bring home as well as their paycheck. Because as you said, uh, probably 40 to 50% of a budget for a service coordinator is other than salary. Uh, between insurances that we have to carry, workers' comp, um, social security that we have to pay, um, you know, all of the things that we pay out in benefits, uh, salary is is probably only about half of what the actual budget line is. And I'm not sure what your your person that was saying that their their salary line item was lower than what they were making. Sometimes I have had. Um, Folks that have looked at our budget submissions, especially for our grants, and they say, well, you know, I'm not making that much in salary. You have to understand that that salary line is not what you're making now. It's also what's projected for you to make over the entire year. So we're factoring in increases that you're going to get this year and all those other things. So, yeah, you might not be making that right now, but at the end of the year, that's what you're probably going to end up making. So just be aware of that when you're looking at a budget line item. But, um, you know, for instance, we've done things like um, we've had we have short term disability that we pay for for our for our employees. Um, we have. Um, uh, uh, what is it? The financial. Um, the watchdogs that look out after your your uh, your whether somebody's stealing your identity or anything like that. We provide that for them for free and they can add their families to that. Uh, we have a retirement. Um, we give them. Um, three percent of their income into their retirement account whether they contribute or not so you could actually take your salary and add three percent to it and i mean that's cash that you're getting too it's going straight into your account um, so we try to find those things that we can do i i know that i've heard my employees and especially the younger ones you know when they say well you know between my deductible on my health insurance and my premiums that i have to pay each month um, you know, I mean, I'll never spend even that amount of money, so insurance will never pay a dime for me. And that's probably true, um, but that's just what the cost is. I mean, we just, um, there's not a lot we can do with health insurances. Um, it's very difficult to find any that are that are reasonable. I can chime in. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Ron. Um, as we have to explain to all of our team members about inflation, and of course, we all know how property insurance for us, especially in California, and I'm sure other states as well, has gone up at least 20 percent. But that's not what our, our, our employees want to hear, right? They want to hear, what are you doing? What are you doing for me? What are you doing for us? And uh, to answer your question very bluntly, it's about 30 percent of their um, salary which is um, going into uh, benefits, unfortunately, which is uh, ridiculous. I mean, that's a third of their uh, compensation on average, more or less. So um, just to put it out there, some, some, some things that we're doing and we, we've done in the past is we do give all of our team members in affordable housing a holiday bonus. Um, last year, we increased uh, their wages by four and a half percent. Um, we did, as I mentioned, the benchmarking in 2022, and we raised some of our service coordinator wages up to 10%. So we just like scrutinized everybody's wage, all 70 plus. And I worked clo closely with the, the VP of operations and some were no brainers. Some were, it's just an ask, you know? So I think you really need to push and you really need to fight. Um, also considering the other frontline team members though, you know, I know sometimes I hear from operations, well, we need to consider the frontline staff. We need to consider maintenance. Absolutely. We need to be equitable. So we need to try and push. And, and my big push is also making sure that those budget-based rent increases happen on an annual basis and that we're um, giving our, our feedback and our commentaries to HUD 
of the why we need to increase the wages. We know how this position has been evolving and there's so much that we ask our service coordinators to do. Um, and we expect high expectations. We have high expectations of that role because they're serving people. So we really need to make sure that we express that um, when we're sending in our contract renewals to, to HUD. Um, also, I think what's key for us is that we give flexibility to our team members. Um, so what we do with service coordinators, we have a lot of um, a lot of moms, a lot of dads too, that uh, need to drop off their kids or pick up their kids early or whatever the case may be. So if they're starting any time between 7.30 and 9 a.m., we give them that flexibility. Um, some we have even work on Saturdays. If that's if it's a part-time position and they wanna do Wednesday and Saturday works for them, absolutely. So we'll work closely with HR to also give them that flexibility. Um, also, if they're going to night school, um, we wanna make sure that we're um, supporting them any way possible. So I think flexibility is key. Um, and also what I appreciate that we do is also PTO cash out. And we do that around the holidays. So that's, that's a nice advantage as well. I would echo what Linda said, um, absolutely. Um, but it, for us also, we, we, we average around 35% um, for fringe benefits. Um, and we offer flexibility, pension, and we're working on, on wellness days. So the job that they do and the stress and the things they handle, just trying to get some some extra days um, if we can. We tried it one year and it worked really well. So um, we're trying to see if that's something that we can have permanent moving forward. So that's important. Yeah, that's great. That was actually a really um, common comment in the salary survey was, can we get mental health days for service coordinators because the job is so stressful. So that in addition to their regular PTO days, if they just had a really hard day that week, can they leave early Friday or something like that um, to decompress? That was something that came up a handful of times. So I'm glad you mentioned that. So we have time for one more question. And so this is kind of the big takeaway that you guys can leave for those in this discussion. Um, and I think it's obvious that you guys all work for larger companies. I mean, that clear from the beginning um, and clear from your answers that you guys are really focused on resident services. You've got a culture of service in your communities. And as a result of that, the service coordinators are naturally very high focus, high priority, right? Um, and so that's amazing. And you've been able to do great things because of that. And so I would love to hear your advice for kind of the every service coordinator, every service coordinator supervisor who's listening to this discussion today. A lot of them don't have the fortune of working for large companies who are service focused. You know, maybe they're the only service coordinator or the only service coordinator supervisor at their company. Um, what's one basic thing that they can take away that they can do today, tomorrow, to support their service coordinator program and try to get that additional funding and support that's necessary for its success. So I'm going to open this up to everybody to kind of talk about what your takeaway should be for anyone who's listening to this discussion, how to support service coordinators. I would say just tell your story. Um, just like Ask says, like, service coordinators are the heartbeat of housing. So no one can tell stories like we can. Like for board reports, annual reports, fundraising, they're always looking for stories. And not only have a story, but have like the little one pager that goes along with it, with your graph, your charts, your statistics, um, just showing the impact of service coordination. And ask to present to the board meetings for different departments so they understand kind of what you're doing and just educating everybody on what you do and even reaching out to the communications department, they're always looking to spotlight different things and promote different things and stories are just huge. So I would just say, tell your story, communicate, communicate, communicate to different departments about what you're doing. I'll say, um, I'll say that, you know, a lot of times I hear people talk about, well, our job is providing housing and that is not our job. Our job is taking care of people. And so if you design your philosophy and your company and your services around taking care of people, then that's what your real job is. If you're only providing housing, you're only doing part of your job. 
Um, I appreciated what Natasha said and um, telling your story. You know, I kind of phrase it as market market your work. And this is something that I did not do when I was, you know, 10, 15 years ago. You know, I just, I just didn't think it was important to tell everybody what we were doing in resident services and realize quickly the importance to really showcase what the service coordinators are doing. And it can be alongside a story that they're doing maybe with operations, with their property manager, with their maintenance, maybe as a team, what they're doing and showcase what they're doing and summarize a story, um, maybe along with residents, uh, taking pictures, sending that out to um, somebody in the organization, whether it's your communications department, whether it's your supervisor, whether it's your CEO, whether it's senior leadership, you know, really showcase um, who we are and what we do. Um, I would also say involve yourself in different committees, reaching out to Melissa Harris, you know, um, is there any committee I can serve on? You know, what's next? What's brewing? You know, and ask, uh, making sure that we're attending the ask conference and that we're uh, networking with others to learn what others are doing across the country. Um, so I think involving yourself um, in different committees and networking and uh, absolutely telling your story uh, are key components. Yes, I love that. That's a great idea and something that everybody can leave this call today and start doing. Everybody already knows um, their residents, their property is best, and so they can go out and start telling their stories right away. So that's an awesome takeaway. And that's all the time we have for today. I so appreciate you all being here with us and sharing your experiences and your expertise with everyone on today's call. Uh, again, thank you for being part of this important discussion. And thanks to all of the people who are in the meeting here for being here today. Thank you. Have thank a good you, afternoon. Melissa. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye.